Hi, everybody. I'm very grateful to Bill and Margaret and all the helpers who put this together, got us together. Thank you. A lot of work. They tell me they'll never do it again, but you never know. So here we are. And I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. I'm from Dover, New Hampshire. This is my email. And I'm going to talk about the vertical or spiral structure of light in space. <clears throat> How light travels through space. Um, and it's a helix. I want to go over the things I would like to tell you in case I don't get around to it before I run out of time. So these are the things I'm going to tell you about, the vortex, how light travels through space, and it does that because space has a spiral grain. That can be debated, and it has been for a long time. I want to tell you about the heart. The heart has a vertical field in it. Light and electricity spiral through the heart. And the heart, the design of the heart, thanks to a Spanish cardiologist by the name of Torrent Guasp, G-U-A-S-P, is a double spiral, and it has the form of this famous um, animation from M.C. Escher, which is a scalar field antenna. And it only has one surface, and such a Surface means that the heart acts as a bi-directional sending and receiving scalar field antenna. I'm going to talk about this device, which I carry in my pocket. I was in Barcelona, and a friend of mine introduced me to an elderly gentleman who had developed a device to protect people from environmental electromagnetic fields. It was tested in four or five Spanish universities. It was discovered that it really balances the body's fields. It does very good things to your physiology. Nobody could understand how it worked. None of the scientists could understand it. Jim, can you explain this? I said, oh yeah. I had any idea. But what I discovered after a lot of looking at this image on the face of it, that it's something called the flower of life. I had never heard of the flower of life before. It's a very interesting design. It's the design on my shirt. I'm going to get a yarmulke with that design because um, you'll, you'll see why. I think the, the morphic field spirals down through the crown chakra and through the heart. That's my guess. Um, going to talk about, briefly mention this school in the Himalayas that is designed along the um, Flower of Life sacred geometry. It's a very happy school. Tibetan, hundreds of Tibetan children uh, go there and they have a good time learning their traditional uh, language and so on. And if any of you happen to stumble over a box full of money, um, would like to get rid of it, these people could use some support. It has won many awards. It's one of the top 10 architectural designs in the world for a school. I was talking about the Flower of Life at a conference, at the uh, Healing Touch conference, and I put up this slide, the Hidden Energy Science of Sacred Geometry by Robert J. Gilbert. Uh, I recommended this article, and I heard this rustling in the back of the room. As I said that, Robert J. Gilbert walked into the room. Give me a break. <laughs> it all started with a question from a student. The student said, Dr. Oshman, how much of the body is matter and how much is empty space? Well, it's 95% empty space, 5% matter. But if you look at that 5% that's matter, 95% of that is empty space. And if you look at the other 
That is 95% empty space, and so on. <laughs> turtles, I guess. Something to do with turtles. So and then I found the proton, which uh, has a spin and it, and it looks like a thing, but it isn't. It's mainly empty space. And inside of it, uh, two up quarks and one down quark. And if you look a little closer, the quarks are connected by uh, gluons. And if you look further, the gluons and the quarks and so on are connected together in a sort of tensegris matrix. And all these little balls are full of nothing. So there's an interesting book that uh, helped out called Void, The Strange Physics of Nothing. And it goes through the history of our beliefs in the fabric of space or the non-fabric of space. And it was very helpful. I'm very interested in the work of Rupert Sheldrake, um, the morphic field. I like people. I'm very interested in the people that everyone else agrees are crazy. Because those are the people who have really good ideas. And Sheldrake has a fantastic idea, which I'll tell you about. Einstein said, if the concept isn't at first absurd, it doesn't stand a chance. So I feel very comfortable with you people because you have lots of absurd ideas. And I look forward to learning more about them. Um, Sheldrake says in his uh, writings that consciousness and memory are not in the brain. And of course, everybody knows that this is where we remember things and consciousness is. Everybody points to their head. Carl Jung said, psyche is not in the head or the brain. And there are lots of very distinguished scholars who say the same thing. Sheldrake says it this way, compares, um, he compares your memory with your TV. I can't study your TV and determine what programs you watched last night. They're not there. They've not left a trace. The main brain may be like a TV, a receiver that tunes into the memory channel, but the show is not stored there. So there's a lot of interest in the possibility that space, the quantum vacuum, is the actual storehouse of memory. And I think there's a lot of merit to that idea. Sheldrake's concepts, morphogenetic fields give rise to all forms. This is really important. People can criticize him all they want, but his ideas touch upon one of the great unsolved problems in biology. How did I form into this thing from a single cell? How does that work? We've spent decades studying morphogenesis, developmental biology, we still don't understand it. This at least is an idea. It's a start. And he might just be right. Matter assumes form when it resonates with a field. The fields involved are not classical electromagnetic fields. I questioned that statement for a long time because I said, how, how do you know it's not a classical electromagnetic field? And then I learned about scalar fields. Ah. <laughs> Scalar fields. So that's, and I gave that story to Sheldrake himself, and he went out and bought Constantine Miles' book on scalar fields. This is an amazing statement. Morphogenetic fields are derived from a body's own past actions and from the structures and actions of ancestors. What a fantastic idea. He just might be right about that. And there are others who agree with them. Fields act across space and time. I'll tell you about Carlo Rivali's uh, model of space, Marvin Solitz's model of space, and some others. Um, beginning Aristotle, Descartes, and Leibniz considered space to be a plenum, a fullness, lots of stuff in space. Newton tossed that idea out. He did not need space to have any structure to operate his laws of gravity. And a couple of decades of pumping air out of a container with a vacuum pump, creating emptiness, confirmed that there's nothing in there. 
But we now know that the vacuum is a very busy place, lots of things going on there. James Clerk Maxwell, one of the most important um, papers in the history of physics, the publication of Maxwell's equations for light. He felt that space had to have a structure to support the electromagnetic wave. Einstein and uh, Minkowski came along. Einstein said space has a fabric and it's a curved fabric. And Einstein, Minkowski, space time. Space time. They go together. Paul Dirac, um, he developed a model of the vacuum as an infinite sea of particles and energy. This came to be called the Dirac Sea. He got the Nobel Prize in 1933. And here's the Dirac Sea. Um, we've got waves in it. Of course, this is 10 to the minus 23 centimeters. It's very, 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 very small. Nobody can see what's going on here with the most powerful microscope. We have to guess what's going on. But basically what Dirac said is the Dirac C, the ether, the quantum vacuum, the quantum plenum, or whatever it is, is constantly emitting positrons and electrons, which immediately annihilate each other in 10 to the minus 35 seconds. And I think a lot of physicists, all physicists don't agree about anything, but I think a lot of physicists agree about this. Roger, Sir Roger Penrose conceived of space as a spin network. Empty space contains structure and energy and information, as Sheldrake is trying to tell us. Mark Cummings says it's not a quantum vacuum. It's a quantum plenum. It's an abundance. It's a fullness. Here are his principles. The plenum is an absolute fullness. It provides the energy that keeps electrons moving in their orbitals in the atom. It provides energy for metabolism and movement. The geometry of organic bonds, our organic chemistry, induces a flux from the plenum into life. It's an infinitely coherent field of luminosity. Wow. Meaning that, and one of the things that Mark Cummings says is, if you could see the light in this room, it would totally blind you. There's an enormous amount of light in this room. But it's all coherent in such a way that every bit of energy going this way is exactly balanced with energy going that way. So it all balances out so it doesn't look like anything is happening. Shift the balance a little bit, of, a little bit and an enormous amount of light comes out as in an atomic bomb. Space is efflorescing with vacuum photons. It's the embedding space for electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is embedded in the quantum plenum. It's the source of the inner light of the spiritual traditions. Carlo Rivali, uh, his famous bestseller, Seven Brief Lessons in Physics, illustrates the quantum vacuum is a fabric of space-time, and he imagines enlarging a bit of the fabric and it has a structure. What that structure is, I'm going to tell you. Here are some more models. Milo Wolf's model from his uh, wave theory of matter. Electron standing waves. He says that every electron is in communication with every other electron in the universe and there are standing waves going back and forth. And the structure of the electron is absolutely dependent on this interchange. Martin Bowald, loop quantum gravity. Marvin Solit, one of my mentors. Holistic geometry. A great man. Not very well known, but he did incredible work. Wholeness and tensegrity. Tensegrity is the balancing of counteracting forces of tension and compression, which gives structures their shapes, strength, and flexibility. It's through the mechanism of tensegrity that wholeness persists in the parts. And it's through the mechanism of tensegrity 
that wholeness can be restored. Marvin and his colleague William Day developed a model for the electromagnetic field derived from tensegris geometry, beginning with a pre-wave. Here you can see the wave. The red shows the, uh, the wave, the blue, the magnetic field, the green, the electric field. They're perpendicular to each other, and they can give rise to the particle we have come to know and love as the photon. Interesting ideas. Wholeness is a starting point. With the limitations of perception, all we can see are parts. Marvin presents a geometric creation story, which demonstrates that the connection between the parts and the whole exists. This is the role of geometry. FND.org, Foundation for New Directions. FND.org, you will find the work of Marvin Solon. Tensegrity, the starting point arose from a sculptor, Kenneth Snelson, fitting together compressing, compression resistant structures called struts with tension resisting structures called tendons. And Buckminster Fuller used this model to design the uh, geodesic dome and many other things. Fuller was a designer, architect, engineer, mathematician, philosopher, and poet. He had 2,000 patents he was thrown out of Harvard twice. Clever guy. Tensegrity is a universal set of building rules that guides the design of organic and man-made structures, from simple carbon compounds to complex cells and tissues. So here you can see a man-made structure, a crane. This is a tensegrity structure. This is the head of the femur. Very similar structure, resisting compression and tension. Wonderful article by Donald Ingber, The Architecture of Life, Scientific American, cover article from uh, whenever it was, 1998. Extending tensegrity to the cellular level. The tensegrity system is defined by a continuous tensional network, tendons supported by a discontinuous set of compressive elements, struts. It's a very good model for the structure of the human body because a tensegrity structure will absorb shock, will withstand heavy loads, and will, if you pluck one of the tendons, the vibrations travel through the whole structure. That's also a good model for the structure of space. This is biotensegrity. Uh, there's now a biotensegrity special interest group that meets in the US and Europe. People who are fascinated by this. And uh, Steve Levin, a orthopedic surgeon, recognized that the intervertebral discs are not compression resistant structures like we think they are. The spine is not a stack of blocks like it's described in medical school. It's actually the vertebrae, each vertebra is lifted off the one below. And this is done through the soft tissues, the ligaments close to the spine. This is Tom Flemons, who's built a number of models. He's on Salt Spring Island. Um, amazing models, very valuable models. This is a model, a complete tensegrity skeleton that can walk, sit, stretch, and contort. It'll stand self-supporting with all the compression elements, the bones floating in the web of tension that is woven around it from top to bottom. It can go for a walk. And Ingber's um, famous article, very good article, highly recommended. Now, a turning point in all of this happened when I met Rudy Schild. I met him at the Foundation for New Directions. Um, where Marvin Solit presided for many years. And Rudy Schild is one of the top astrophysicists, cosmologists in the world. He's the chairman of the cosmology department at Harvard. Uh, he operates at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. 
He's the editor of the Journal of Cosmology, and he's the director of this 60-inch uh, telecast telescope on Mount Hopkins in Arizona, the largest telescope in the world that is exclusively devoted to spectroscopy of different stars and galaxy, galaxies. He has a lot of ideas about what's going on out there. We had a, uh, a little gathering to watch the film Thrive at Marvin's Institute there in Cambridge. And Rudy Shield got up and in response to a question, he said, forget about dark matter and dark energy. We had to conceive those to make our equations balancing, balance, but that's not what's happening. It's all consciousness. When I got back up off the floor, I said, Dr. Schild, do you talk like that in public? <laughs> well, he said, yes, as a matter of fact, we have just published. It's a very thick book. It's been published in the uh, Journal of Cosmology, Quantum Physics, Evolution, Brain, and Mind, Consciousness and the Universe. I got this book, highly recommended. And it's all about the ideas of space and cosmology, 2011. Rudy Schild thinks that black holes are where memories are stored because of their relativistically continuous contraction and continuous acquisition of more mass, black holes can serve as nature's hard drives holding copies of the quantum holograms generated by each new moment of human experience, as well as each new event occurring to non-living objects. Everything is recorded in black holes in the edge of the black hole. This is a fantastic idea. How can my thought, how can my words, how can my wave to you get stored in a black hole? And with scalar fields, it's trivial because they travel, if they have a velocity, it's a billion times the speed of light. My thoughts, my words, my actions can reach every black hole in the universe in a very, very short time. And if I need to extract information from that storage, vast storage vault, it comes very fast. Russians have worked out, um, and that's another story, but the velocity of scalar fields. So here's the uh, cosmic hard drive. It's a black hole. One of the things that happened was, I think I missed something. OK. Marvin was working on the uh, platonic solids. And he developed a model of a tensegrity structure from which you could derive all, of the, all five of the platonic solids. Marvin was ill, he, had a, he was having kidney failure, he had to go have um, support kidney uh, dialysis. He didn't like that, it was unpleasant. He decided he was done with that. He quit his dialysis and he got a phone call or an email from um, Vladimir Ginsburg. Vladimir Ginsburg said, Marvin, your discovery of the origin of the platonic solids is the most important discovery in geometry since Plato and Pythagoras. Well, that acknowledgement made Marvin feel his life was complete. So he left us immediately. Vladimir Ginsburg has written five books on the spiral grain of the universe. I don't think anybody reads them, except me, and maybe some of you. They're very interesting books. <coughs> Spiral grain of the universe. It's a concept that has arisen again and again and again in physics. The greatest minds of physics have preoccupied lots of their time thinking about the vorte vortex. Um, Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell spent a lot of time in Cambridge 
I wish I could go back and listen to their conversations discussing the fabric of space and how the electromagnetic wave is a vortex. The big problem facing physics is the very, very tiny scale of the fabric of space, if there is such a fabric. It's way beyond the resolution of any microscope. It can only be measured or estimated indirectly. The scale where relativity meets quantum mechanics meets gravity is called the Planck length, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 meters, or 0 0.0000, a lot of zeros, meters. We can't see that. The fabric is a million, million times smaller than an electron. That's pretty small. Well, we wrote a paper about the vertical structure of light in space. And we think we figured out the structure of space from biology. And my collaborator is my child bride, Nora. And there we are. And we wrote this in the Journal of uh, Vortex Science and Technology. Here's the discovery. This has been known for a long time. The cornea is the layer right under the, it's a layer of connective tissue right underneath the corneal epithelium. The epithelium is the thin layer of cells that gets scratched if you scratch your eye and it heals in two days. Beneath that is a very tough layer composed of collagen fibers and they are arranged in a plywood-like structure. There's a layer with the fibers going in one direction. Next layer, the fibers go in another direction. Next layer, a different direction, and so on, as you see here. It makes for a very strong structure, and it makes for a transparent structure. And the reason it's transparent is because the geometry is perfect for a vortexing photon to make its way through the corneal stroma to the retina. How about that? And it turns out that if the spacing of the corneal stroma is distorted, for example, if you put a poison in the eye and it poisons the cells that hydrate the stroma, the stroma becomes uh, opaque. So this arrangement, this geometry, is very important to vision and getting light through it. And studies have shown that the vortex, the light vortex, is a right-handed helix, and it's a right-handed helix for both eyes. Now, the reason that is really remarkable is that we have bilateral symmetry in our bodies. This is a law of biology, bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry means my right hand and my left hand are not the same. They are symmetrical. This is a violation of that law of physics. Why is it like that? How does it get to be like that? It means that for us to see light, the light has to be going as a right-handed helix into our eyes. There it is. Froggy. And what happens, and uh, this is another story altogether, but um, we're going to have Dr. Paul later in the conference. He is my absolute hero. Uh, his, his work is the most important work for me in the last decade. Why for me? Because I'm interested in two things that haven't been explained. How is it that I can, with my hand 18 inches away from your body, how can I do healing without touching? And at the same time, the amount of energy has to be very, 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 very low. Turns out it's just the right amount of energy. And how are people disturbed by a cell tower that's a mile away. Why do they feel ill when they go under a high tension line? Not everybody is like that, but there is an increasing epidemic of electromagnetic sensitivity, actually electromagnetic illness. In Sweden, it's recognized as 
a uh, health condition by the government. It's a condition that you can get government uh, funds for. So what is going on is this is these are called um, seven TM transmembrane um, serpentine receptors. And this kind of receptor is found throughout the body. There are thousands of receptors like that look like this. This is a cell membrane. This one goes back and forth across the cell membrane seven times. The one that uh, Dr. Paul will talk about is um, the voltage-gated calcium channel, which has a protein that goes back and forth, I think, 14 times. Maybe it's 23. Although it just is an amazing structure. And what I think is the way our bodies are regulated, I don't buy the classical explanation. Uh, the story that you read in the physiology texts, it's well over 100 years old, and it's holding us back. The story is hormones and other um, information molecules stick themselves into receptors on cell membranes and activate the cell. I don't believe it. First of all, this idea, it's called uh, the lock and key model. Everybody can get it because everybody's put a key in the lock, turned it, opened the door. It's easy to understand, and it's probably just a part of the story. What I think happens is that hormones vibrate and emit electromagnetic fields that activate receptors on the cell surface, and they may actually go through the cell membrane to the cell interior and may do things inside the cell as well. These are alpha helices. These are all alpha helices. So the idea is that these alpha helices facilitate the entry of vertical light into the cell. We don't think this way because of good old Lucretius. He had an idea, Lucretius and uh, Democrates and Epicurus, and those old Greeks had this idea of atoms being billiard ball-like particles, solid particles. We know that atoms are not solid particles. Uh, here's, this is from a textbook, a popular textbook of biochemistry, and it's got an error. It says, if you look at the alpha helix, if you look down through the alpha helix, it looks like it's hollow in this ball and stick model. But we know that that's wrong. It's not hollow, because if you use a space filling mo mo model, the space in the middle is full of stuff. That's wrong. This textbook is wrong, because what's inside these spheres is nothing. There's nothing in there. So light can, of course, go right through that. So the space filling models, which, which I have loved and used to demonstrate chemistry to students for years, gives you a picture of what a, an atom or a molecule looks like. Totally bogus. So there's the photon spiraling through space through the alpha helix in the cell membrane. And it's interesting, here's the calcium-gated potassium channel. And look at how the, and this is done with um, different diffraction technologies. Look how the, vort the vortices, the helices, are at all different angles. This looks to me, this is a guess, this is a perfect design to collect light coming from molecules, signal molecules, at many different angles to the surface of the cell membrane. That's what it looks like to me. Now, this idea that the alpha helices might be light pipes is well known in botany. Animal physiologists wouldn't pay any attention to botany. That's plant stuff. You guys are over there in the botany department. Stay there. Well, it turns out there's a structure called the phycobilisome. And the botanists accept the idea that these are elegantly designed light pipes that enable cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, 
and red algae to funnel excitation energy to the reaction center very quickly, less than 100 picoseconds. So this is an idea that's accepted in botany and not discussed in physiology. This is the device I told you about, the front of the device. It took me a while. I just wrote a paper. It was just published a few days ago about this. I, these people, they said, can you figure out how this works? It took me a while to figure it out. But I think that this design is a fundamental. I wear it. I had a muscle, muscle testing done by a highly sophisticated muscle tester. And I am stronger when I wear this shirt, especially if it's colored. I have a black and white one, not quite as good. This one is very good. And so this facilitates, I believe, the exchange between my body and the morphic field, the bi-directional exchange of energy and information with the morphic field. The design is of the, um, the, the sacred geometry, this is phi, uh, very familiar to lots of people. Um, scientists down through the ages, philosophers, mystics, architects, all kinds of people. Many scientists have just gone away from the lab and just thought about phi, the golden mean or the golden ratio. Recently, it's been discovered that it exists at the quantum scale. So this completes the cycle, the cycle, the story. Um, there are two papers, this one and this one, quantum criticality in an Ising chain. This is experimental evidence for phi operating at the quantum scale. Mei Wan Ho, late Mei Wan, Mei Wan Ho, and a Egyptian scientist, and Giuseppe Vitello, who is from the uh, wonderful physics institute in Milano, collaborated on this paper, is space-time fractal and quantum coherent in the golden mean? It looks like it is. This is the story of how Sheldrake's morphic field and how memory and learning and experiences are stored in the field, and it is the scalar field of the heart and other things. So this is the reference for it. This is the school I told you about, the award-winning school, designed on sacred geometry. If you ever get to Tibet, Tibet, check it out. And the best Asian building, the best education building, the best green building in the world, Architecture Awards of 2002. Nominated as one of the 10 most beautiful schools in the world. I want to go there. Well, my time is up, and I have time for questions. And I've enjoyed spending this time with you, and I hope I've given you something to think about. One thing I couldn't uh, understand with regard to light, I, I see the spiral nature that you're talking about. Is this meant to replace the uh, conventional understanding of electromagnetic waves by Maxwell's equations and such, or is it meant to supplement it? Here's what happened. Maxwell and Faraday spent many, many hours over many months talking about the nature of the electromagnetic field. And Maxwell eventually published his paper, which had 20 equations. My time's up. <laughs> had 20 equations describing the electromagnetic field. And a number of what happened to Maxwell is he died at an early age, in his early 50s. And he had some people who didn't like his equations. And so they deleted most of them, leaving us with the four equations that are taught in physics classes today. We, that has been a great disaster 
for medicine and physics and biology, uh, we haven't been thinking about these equations. What they didn't like the idea of the scalar field because it doesn't have a velocity. It travels infinitely uh, everywhere in the universe instantaneously. They didn't like that, so they deleted it. We're getting back to looking at that. So the electromagnetic field in, in his final paper, Maxwell left out the vortex. They had spent many, many, many months talking about the vortex. They left it out. Um, so you're, you're talking then about a complement to what now exists as, as Maxwell's four equations. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. And people are going back and looking at those original equations, and they're very valuable and very important. They help us understand, you know, it is said often that prayer and distant healing can't work because there's no physical basis for it. I'm sorry. There is a physical basis for it. Ah, uh, since nobody else is lining up at the uh, microphone right now, the uh, something that I had trouble understanding in your talk is that um, the uh, spiraling structure that you refer to, uh, which is characteristic of, of circularly polarized light, that's only one of, of numerous possible polarization bases, but leaving that aside, um, the length of the spiral, the pitch of the spiral, if you're accustomed to thinking of screws, depends on the wavelength of the light. And our cornea passes more or less uniformly uh, light of, of wavelengths spanning a full octave. Red light is about twice the wavelength of violet light. Uh, I don't see how if the uh, structure of the layering in the of fibers in the cornea is so critical to transmission of light, how it can possibly tr pass light of more than one critical wavelength that fits the structure. Could you elucidate that, please? What a fabulous question. Thank you. Uh, I've been trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> That's as far as I've gotten. What a, what a good line, right? Eh? Oh, well, I can not have an answer. I'm working on it. Sounds like some politicians would go. So thanks. I'll get back to you on that when I figure that out. My question's a lot simpler. And um, I was just wondering, I spent four months living and working up at the school, Drop White Lotus School, as the electrical engineer. And I've worked on it for quite a few years. And I was just wondering, you know, uh, just because you touched on it so Briefly, I was wondering if you could just expand, like, you know, what, what you refer to it with, and like, you know, what your, what your link, or if you've had any work that's been directly associated with the school in Ladakh. The one that you mentioned, the, I think it was like your second last slide. So you've been there? I have. I've lived and worked as the electrical engineer for it. Um, oh, for nice. <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> it's worth a visit. Well, the fellow who organized the Breath of Life conference in London a couple of weeks ago, and Jerry and I both were there, um, his name is Michael, um, something. anyway, he made this school happen. Do you know him? I, Michael? Yeah, I know who you mean, yeah, one of the, fa one of the founders. <clears throat> and it's a, an example of when you get your mind set on something, if, you're, if it's your purpose, and to me, the real purpose of healing work is to help people manifest their destiny. In the, in the Sufis tradition, it's called kismet, destiny. And most of the people we see around us are not following their destiny. And when you are following your destiny, the way I like to say it is, the winds will fill your sails. And that's what happened with Michael Kern. He has the Dalai Lama behind him. He has some wealthy people in England behind him. And he's getting contributions from all over the world. 
that's I think that is that is true, but I think they're still I think they're they they're still really struggling with recent developments actually for for contributions. That's yeah, they had a flood. Yeah, a mudslide. So they're still they're always coming back trying to source more new new fundraising or, or contributions, but.